open in prayer now as the worship team is going to lead us. Father God, we want to thank you for today. We thank you for everyone who's here. God, we each have people in our lives that need to know you. And we ask that today that you would help us to understand more how to reach them, understand more about what you want us to do for you. And we thank you, God, for this, for this time that we have together. And we just want to lift up our voices now in worship of you. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Please stand as we sing. We're going to start with a new song. Um, so I'm going to start with the chorus, actually, and teach it to you a little slower. And then we're going to get into the song. I think you're going to like it. It really spoke to me this week when I, uh, when I heard it. So it goes like this. For the good. Make a joyful noise this morning. There's lots of people here, so here we go.
Aren't you glad you have a solid rock under your feet this morning? Aren't you glad? You know, there are so many things we could take a stand on, but the solid rock, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for this reminder that Jesus Christ is our living hope. Not a faint hope, not a a transitory hope, a living, vital, constant hope and security. Father, thank you. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. This past week, we got together as leaders. As we're heading to the fall, it's always kind of a restart at a time when everyone's coming back to the doors again off of holidays and summer vacation and all that. And uh, it's time to kind of launch again. And um, it's awesome to see different leaders and their abilities and their gifting um, come together for the same purpose of wanting to bless the church, of wanting to say, here I am, use me, God, uh, for your purposes. And uh, we will continue to grow with that. And there's lots of us here who have many giftings that Lord wants to use also. And uh, we don't want to deny that. We want to see God has bless all of us and, and a certain thing. As, as we continue to grow, he's going to need each one of us as a body. And uh, so we're going to pray right now for our, for our fall. We're going to pray for ministry. We're going to pray for Stan Sally. I mean, this is a huge part. I mean, to see that many kids run out. I don't know how many were there, 20, 30, I don't know, lots. They got, they got their hands full. Um, but kids are like for the church. They're the next generation. We're excited. I mean, they're going to they're gonna get blessed this morning. And our leaders need energy. They need insights and wisdom for what they're going to do. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, even as we worship this morning, again, we're reminded, God, that the world is a shaky place right now. But God, we get to stand on you. Yeah. You are our solid ground. Yeah. And Lord, when we stand on you, things are gonna happen. Lord, we're not gonna be we're not living in a bubble, God. We still have things going on in our lives. That's right. That's right. But God, we still stand on you. We still stand on that rock Lord, that never changes, that's always there. Father, today is a new day again. Father, your, your mercies are new again this morning. Your grace is always there for us. And Father, we just pray, Lord, as we, as we see the seats fill in here again, Lord, to see familiar faces again, just come together as a, as a body. Lord, it's exciting. Lord, it's exciting to see us all worship together. It's, all, it's exciting to see all the young kids come. And Father, we just pray for the ministries right now. We just pray for your blessing on, on all the leaders, Lord, who are, are excited for what you're going to do. Father, we're excited to see, Lord, your spirit come and move and, and equip and set captives free. We want to see lives change, Father. And there's so many different aspects that go on, whether it's coming through the door and being greeted by somebody whether it's making coffee this morning that we just take for granted, but someone had a heart and a desire, Lord, to say, Lord, I'll do that. Father, we just thank you for that. Lord, prepare our hearts. Lord, help us, Lord, to be your instruments. Lord, that, that say yes to you. Lord, we need you more than ever, Lord. This world, this town needs you more than ever. Father, may we be that place that people come through the doors and know, Lord, that they're they were walking on solid ground. Lord, thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, as Pastor Gary is going to come and, and, and speak this morning again, open our ears and our hearts to you. Lord, we know, Lord, that you've spoken to him. Lord, he has a word as we, as we pray this morning. And Lord, we know, Lord, he has a word for us. Father, may it go deep into each one of our hearts. Lord, thank you for what you're going to do. Bless our time. Bless the kids. Bless all the ministries going on right now. Lord, you're covering over them. Lord, your protection, your strength, your guidance for each one of you. Ask in your son's name. Amen. You know, I was preparing uh, 
to continue in our series in Ephesians, and yet I realized that the series needed to take a bit of a turn because we're heading into the fall, and, and it's not just, um, you know, what Paul was saying to the Ephesians church. It's what he's saying to us. And when we look at what we've been talking about, we were saying with the Ephesians that the great danger, the real fear that they had to encounter and that they had to address was the fact that even though they were, you know, on a roll, they were a church that was serving and they loved to, to do thing for, things for God's people, there was a problem. And the problem was, as we read later in Revelation, that they were, the danger was they would lose their first love. That they would somehow, in the midst of, of following Christ, lose sight of Christ. And how in the world does that happen? Well, I think, I think I'm beginning to understand how it could. These are interesting days that we are living in, right? And if we were to take just a, a, a sketch, just a little bit of a page of what we're on right now in our world, what would be some of the things that would uh, pop up on the page in terms of concerns, fears, struggles? What's out there? You tell me this morning. What do you think? Do you guys read newspapers? Suicide. Suicide. Wow. Let's start with something light and easy. Yeah. It's hard. There's war. Family. Family. Illness. Yep. Big loud because my ears are small and tiny and don't hear well. Yep. Isolation. Isolation. You bet. In a connected age, we're disconnected. What else? Homelessness. You know, there's challenges as we look uh, around our town and we see some of the stuff. Uh, one of the um, local police officers that uh, we have a privilege of ministering to as a congregation, Travis came in and he said, you know, it's interesting days in the town right now. You just get a cruiser fixed and back on the road and it gets rammed again. And... He said, you know, we've been instructed, don't chase because you don't know what they're prepared to do. Wow. Anything else out there that you sort of touch on and go, this, is, this isn't good? What do you think? Loneliness. 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 Wow. Big voice. Racism. Racism. Yeah. You know, we're, we have the Nawash House of Prayer coming back, and they ministered to us in March. And um, it's the Sunday before Orange Shirt Day. And uh, as we're talking with Stan and Sally about this, and knowing that the Soggy First Nation is is a part of our community, we really felt that it would be a powerful message to the folks from the uh, Cape Croker Reserve that are coming down to minister to us if on that Sunday we were wearing orange shirts. So uh, Stan is gonna have a, a bunch of them and the proceeds for the sale of those shirts is gonna go to assist the women's house on the Saugeen Reserve. You think about that. In an age where there's a lot of messages that get sent, right? What would it look like for those folks to come and minister to us and we're wearing the shirts that send that message that every child matters and that as a congregation we're concerned for systemic racism and, and wanting to make a difference. So that... You know, as I was churning on this, these are the kinds of things that were going through my mind. And I realized, no, we need to continue in Ephesians. But what we need to have in response to what we're seeing is that we need to have a thriving faith in trying times. 
Because if we're convinced that Jesus Christ is the answer, that he is our living hope, then how do we develop a kind of faith that, that thrives in the midst of these challenging circumstances? Is it needed? Oh my goodness. I sat down with a family just recently and um, the family was sharing and one of the daughters spoke up and she said, I'm 61 years old. And let's face it, it's no secret. My life has been a failure. I'm the one who didn't launch. I'm the one who didn't succeed. What hope for, the, for me is there in life? The rest of my days are just going to be a repeat of the same. Wow. This is someone who knew Christ in her younger years. I said, I think the answer is staring you in the face. You have to restore the hope that you once had. How do we do that? I don't think we do it by offering up platitudes. I don't think we do that by, by making trite uh, responses to, to deep, deep hurts and needs. I think we offer the hope that we have in Christ and we explain why that hope is gonna make a difference. So I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter four. And as we break down Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 24, we're going to see what Paul was speaking about and why he challenged the Ephesians to, to ground themselves again on that rock that was beneath their feet and how they could have an answer for the, the world that they lived in, but also that they could thrive in that world, not losing their first love, but actually building on it. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 17. And I want you to, to pick up on what Paul is saying. And he's urgent in the insistence that he brings forward. He says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. And Gentiles, again, it's sort of a catch uh, phrase, a catch um, grouping for everyone outside of Christ. Okay, that's how we perceive that as we read the scriptures this morning. And he says that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Don't live in the manner of those around you. Do, don't go there. Why? What is it? Because he says that in the futility of their thinking, he's describing what is wrong with the way they approach life. Futile thinking. I looked up that word, and, and in the Greek, what it means is it, it's an aimless or a purposelessness that has overtaken life and has become the way and the manner of how they conduct themselves. Aimless, purposelessness, a lack of direction, lost, lost. Anybody here ever been lost? You know, lost in the woods, lost on the road. Nobody's hands going up. Or never, okay, a few. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, you see, you guilt them long enough, and it's like, yeah, okay, you got me. All right. Let's say you're driving. All right, Steve, you've never been lost when you're driving, right? No, no, no. Okay. Um, you're going somewhere, and you realize, oh, this is not heading in the direction that... that uh, you know, I thought I was supposed to be heading in. We're not getting closer. In fact, we may be getting further away. Um, you've got some choices to make then, don't you? Uh, I know what I do. You see, and it, and it doesn't always work, but it's worked just often enough for me to convince myself that this really is the right approach to take. When you're lost and you come to that realization, well, you, you, you sort of angle your course generally in the direction you need to go. You may not know the roads you're turning onto, but you have such a profound sense of direction, and it always worked on the farm, that if you're lost in one field, you eventually sort of find yourself in the field you're supposed to be in. So you just take that approach. And sometimes it works out that you get to your destination. Sometimes you get further lost. 
because it, it wouldn't enter into my head to actually retrace the steps that I took to get me into the particular man I'm in. We don't often think that way, do we? Because we don't want to waste time and you don't want to, you know, maybe admit that you're lost. You know, you just took a detour. There's that kind of loss, right? But let's face it, in the grand scheme of things, that's the easy form of getting lost. What are some other ways of getting lost? What about if you're feeling like you've gotten lost in life? Anybody ever, uh, I don't know, go to school for a course that really wasn't going to get you a job? Anybody ever do that? Yeah. <laughs> Noah's like, oh, yeah, I've been there. Yep, Steph. What's it like to invest time and energy into education and then realize, not going to get me what I'm looking for? What do you think, Steph? Frustrating. Frustrating. Yeah. Because you, you embark on a course and you think, you know, that you thought it well through. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Sometimes careers can look like that too, right? You start a job, you have a, a good intention with it, and then you realize, yeah, this isn't getting me where I need to go. Anybody ever had that? Noah, you're just smiling like crazy back there. You've had a few jobs like that, kind of, you know, they... It sounds like a country song, but it's true. There are dead end jobs that, you know, you just find yourself in. And that can be hard because you face the prospect of wasted, not just, you know, a few hours on the road. Now we're talking months, years of your life that you've given towards something and you realize this hasn't got me where I thought I needed to go. It, it's more confidence shaking, isn't it? When you find yourself in that place of uncertainty and you realize, man, I've wasted a lot of time and energy on this. There's other ways that that can happen too. Friendships, relationships. I've had people say, you know, my marriage was a total waste. Wow. I've thrown all this energy into it now. Where did it get me? What about if you've gotten further on in years and you say that about your entire life? What does that look like? See, there's, there's the, the momentary frustration of being lost on the road and, you know, having to make up for lost ground and lost time and, you know, lost gas. There's the frustration that comes from, from you know, embarking on a life course, relationship, uh, job, education, and finding that it didn't work out the way you thought it would. But what if your life consisted of that? It's not just frustrating at that stage, is it? It gets desperate at that point. It gets desperate. And you know, sadly, in our community, uh, Sarah, you said it, suicide. You reach the end of that rope and realize, I don't have a reason to live. Wow. It begins to put this kind of a passage into context when we, we say, well, that futility can be in, in incremental stages towards a place where the lostness is actually completely, totally, uh, desperately lost. So why is it then that we feel we have something to offer? Paul goes on and he says they're darkened in their understanding. And here's a key thing, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. What is it like to try and convince somebody? And, and I'm going to suggest that in this instance, it's probably the guys 
who, you know, in the midst of driving and, you know, your wife is lost on the road and you're trying to convince her of the right direction to take and the smiles are forming on people's faces because we all know that it's actually more often, Sarah, you're smiling like crazy. And there was a sideways glance a little bit, but Lou, you're not biting at all on that. No. Okay. Got it. What is it like to try and convince someone that, you know, that stubborn little streak that you have has got your hands committed to a direction on the road, even though the advice that you're getting from that co-pilot beside you is contrary to the direction you're going, you're not biting. From the co-pilot seat, how does it feel to try and convince somebody you're going the wrong way? How's it feel? Oh, come on, ladies, I know you've been there, come on. Yeah, frustrating. Sue, you shook your head with vehemence and you said, oh, your claws are out and your teeth are grinding. Good night. You feel this, don't you? Yes. Okay. That's great too, if you're in the ride with them, because it takes you further away with them. Wow. Did everybody get that? We don't live in isolation, even though we can feel isolated. We don't live in perpetual loneliness. There are times when together with those who we're in this ride of life with, we've entrusted something to them and they're taking us in the wrong direction. And it gets scary, doesn't it? Yeah. And, you know, Paul goes on and he said, you know, there is a progression in the hardening of their hearts, having lost all sensitivity. What kind of danger is there when you've lost sensitivity? I had a teacher in public school. He, uh, he, he loved to demonstrate that when he was playing football, his pinky finger had a nerve severed. And he said, I don't feel anything in this finger. And we're like, okay, what does that mean? So literally, and I don't know if it was bravado or just that the teaching standards were kind of lax back then. I don't know what it is, but this guy would take his shoe off and not a sneaker, you know, not one of those memory foam sketcher things. No, no, this was a shoe. And he would put his finger on the desk and he'd hammer it and he'd say, see, I feel nothing. And we all thought, that's so cool. That's so weird. What does it look like when you lose all sensitivity? What does it look like when a spouse loses sensitivity towards the other? You know, I was just, I had a wedding yesterday and you know, the promises that get made at a wedding, wow, some pretty serious stuff, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Anybody find that uh, in a marriage relationship, I, it doesn't happen, I get that. When your spouse is sick and you feel like maybe they're not as sick as they're seeming to be, Wow, all of the same people are smiling. You guys are like, wow. Bronwyn, does, does Jacob ever sort of, you know, and Jacob's going, no, don't even go there. You know, that head cold that is just like, and you're feeling like, man, you are milking that. You are, come on. And, you know, as, a, as the person who has been behind the illness and, and feeling it, there's nothing like having a spouse who has lost sensitivity to how you're feeling, right? And again, we can have fun with this this morning, but what about when it's real? If you've ever cried tears that were wasted, you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever felt something keenly and have expressed it 
and it fell on deaf ears. You know what I'm talking about. Having lost all sensitivity. It says they've given themselves over to sensuality to, as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Here's the thing that happens in life when you're lost and you, you feel the frustration, you feel the pain, you feel all of the things that, that you wrestle with in looking for meaning in life and not finding it. Guess what you do? When you begin to lose sensitivity, you heighten the indulgence. Right? When the fix doesn't fix anymore, you go for a stronger fix. It's the law of diminished return. When you're in trouble and you want to comfort yourself, you get kind of foolish. And it doesn't stop at one drink, it's two or three or four. And the hit that used to be okay, just you need a little bit more. And let's face it, there are other drugs out there than alcohol and drugs. There are lots of ways that we, that we indulge ourselves in and that increasingly feed the incident the insensitive nature or the lack of sensitivity in our lives, when we're starting to feel dead inside, we go to a, a lot of lengths to sort of feel alive when really we're just doing more dead. It's a good thing Paul turns the corner in this passage because I don't know about you, but this is a heavy, isn't it? This is just a whole lot of not fun. But this is the real, that if we look at our trying times, this is what we're up against. Because this is our world. And the ways and means that people are choosing to cope is getting ramped up. And a corresponding uh, factor with that then is the consequences of this ramped up indulgence. Paul turns the corner and he says, but you did not come to know Christ that way. That was not where you went. Surely you, were, you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to that former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by the deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds. To put on a new self, a new way of being, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Because when, if futility is a lack of direction, a lack of purpose, and a lack of, of, of knowing where to be in life, then Christ is the answer because he's the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, we sang this morning, on Christ the solid rock I stand. And when the floods of life hit, and, and let's face it, we've seen some kind of desperate stuff in the news lately. You know, you look at the scenes coming out of Pakistan. A third of the country underwater. Where did people go? Like literally, where did they go? You tell me. In the scenes that you've seen, where a third of your country is flooded, where you go? Higher ground, right? You move to higher ground. Let that sink in for a little bit. You move to higher ground. And ultimately, the highest ground, the greatest place of, of rest and peace and security in life is Jesus Christ. If we want to have a, a life to be lived in trying times, then we need to have a thriving faith. We need to be on the higher ground that even though the trouble still comes, it doesn't mean that we're, 
you know, we live lives isolated from hurt. Anybody fell for the line that said, you know, if, if you're in the center of the will of God, it's the safest place to be. And then you look around and you go, it's not feeling real safe right now. It doesn't change the truth. It just shows you the way to live in the midst of it. Jesus is the way, even if the way is not as easy as we'd like it to be. There isn't a guarantee of safety being in the center of God's will. But there is a guarantee of security. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of grieving in this congregation, haven't we? Well, we're talking about that this morning, Dwight. We've had a lot of folks that have lost loved ones or who are close to loved ones who are in a fight for their lives. And it's hard. You know, in the, the abiding hope, we were at Judy's, Judy Trudgeon's funeral a week ago Thursday. And when it hurts, because we realize that a little less than a year ago, we had been in the same church, a lot of the same people grieving the loss of Brian, her husband. But you know, when you have those eternal moments where life and death is just starkly in front of you because death has made its appearance yet again, I mean, we, we looked at that picture and we said, this picture, though hard to take, is, is a rejoicing one because Judy's with Brian, their daughter Susan. That kind of reunion, that's why. One of the reasons why. We have that eternal hope that doesn't forsake us, but we also have a hope in this life because we're not living in futility. There's a purposefulness to our lives. There's an aim that we're shooting for. And there's a consequence to living as we do, and it's eternal. So, where do we go with this? If we are created to be new, then we have to have a focus of what we're putting on. Um, we've spent a lot of time with the grandkids over the summer. And I love my granddaughters, but grandpa seems to be the target. You know, if there's water to be thrown, they don't throw it at Cindy, I don't know why. No, I do actually, really truthfully. Um, if there's mud to be slung, if there's, you know, you're fishing for frogs with a net, and let's face it, if you're hunting for frogs with a net, Every other net full comes up with that slimy green stuff. And, you know, Sawyer and Ocean, Kins and Bryn, they, they take no end of delight decorating Grandpa in slime. And, you know, you, you, I have felt the funk. Uh, it, it's there and it clings and it's not fun. But the beauty of it is that it washes off. And that you can, you know, get out of those clothes that are funky and you can change into something clean. It's a glorious thing. And if I'm not getting dirty doing, you know, the, the slimy funk from the, the pond, you know, we've been uh, cleaning out Cindy's uh, mom's place and, and her dad, uh, we love Gord. He was an amazing dad, but he collected stuff. And last weekend, uh, we emptied out two garden sheds. And several generations of squirrels were storing walnuts in there. And several generations of termites were eating, you know, the wood that he had faithfully stored there. For what purpose, I do not know. But we were emptying it out. And do you remember how we felt, Cindy? Yeah, oh, that face. There it is, captured in all of its beauty. It's that... that you know, and, and what is the, the great thing about having that on you is that it washes off. You can put something clean on. Oh. 
people in our world without Christ and without hope have to wear it every day. Let me say that again. People without hope and without Christ have to wear it every day. You want to talk about futility. Aren't you glad you got something new to put on? Are you glad that Jesus says you don't have to wear that? You don't have to sit in the funk. You can come to me and I'll get rid of that. This morning, we need to know that that truth that we have in God's Word, that, that you know, we, we remind ourselves of it, it is never more needed than it is right now. In these trying times, a thriving faith is the only way to approach it. And that's what we've got to develop. Over the next number of weeks, I'm excited because this is what we're going to be diving into. How do we get this thriving faith? Because if we don't have it, guess what? You're going to find yourself in a funk. You will. And the longer we resist turning over those things and, and, and taking back on Christ and standing in him, the longer we'll find ourselves just wearing it. We don't need to. Of all people who know that we don't have to wear this, it should be us. James White wrote a book, The Church in an Age of Crisis. I read it 10 years ago. He missed the mark. Because the crisis he predicted in coming days, he was thinking a generation from now would be the outflow of it. We're in it now. I'm reading chapter after chapter in this book, and, and I'm thinking, you know, this is awesome stuff. It just happened way sooner than he said it would. We're in it now. And things like the environmental crisis, things like the hopelessness that people feel in their lives. And he predicted increasing waves of suicide because hopelessness would grip the hearts of men and women. thriving faith we have is not only what we can wear. It's not only what we can walk around this world in. It is the thriving faith that we have to offer. I had three weddings this summer. In the middle of the two weddings, I uh, was sitting with a fellow across the table, and uh, he was talking about life. He said, you know, this past year stunk. I said, well, I know why, you know, the stunk was general around, but uh, what was your stink? What was your stuff? And he said, well, my wife left me just over a year ago. I said, that, that's pretty stinky. Yeah. And he said, you know, and I didn't see it coming. You know, I just woke up one day, she wasn't there, and, and I looked around the house and her stuff was gone. How does that happen? How does it happen that it just, you know, it was like we were going so good and then we weren't. And I said, well, did it really happen just like that? He said, yeah, just overnight. Well, you know, like, like we weren't vacationing together anymore. And he started to talk about things. And, you know, she had changed a job and, and she worked long hours and we didn't see each other a whole lot. And during COVID, you know, we had nothing to do. So she did her thing and I did mine. I said, are you picking a few threads out of this thing right now? He said, what do you mean? I said, sounds like this was brewing for a while. He goes, you know, you're right. I wish I'd talked to you sooner. I wish he had to. People who are living futile lives may not know it. And they may need somebody just to gently 
point out a few things. Maybe some of the funk that they're wearing that they don't realize. That's what we can do. That's what we have to do. My prayer this morning, and I want to close with this. The burgers are getting packed even as we speak. And I have no doubt that you're sitting here this morning and for some, you're just grateful, right? You've got a loving spouse, you've got a family, your life is rolling, your life is good. Maybe for others, you're, you're going, when's this gonna stop? You know, we've been, we've been dealing with stuff and it's like the tap just doesn't seem to get turned off. And how am I supposed to exist in a situation like that? And maybe earlier in the sermon when we talked about the kinds of things that we do to numb out when, when the fix you've been fixing on doesn't fix anymore. Maybe you've been feeling just a little bit of conviction at that point. Let me suggest this. Erin's going to come and she's going to bring that song that uh, was just confirmed right now. There you go. I want to suggest this. You can have that thriving faith that's needed in this age. There are people around you that need you to have that thriving faith. And if you're in the midst of trying times personally, then that rock that we sang about earlier, that is Christ, you need to get your feet on it. You need to. And if you're thinking, well, you know, I've done this before and it, it didn't stick, can I suggest do it again? Because the alternative is what? Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And in trying times, he is the rock that we need. He's the rock that our world needs. Let's pray. Jesus, we... Uh, Lord, we're quietly aching Because when we, when we take a survey or when we, we think about the lives of folks around us, we see evidence of that futility. Maybe it's family members that are wrestling through things and, and they, they just always seem to be lacking that stability. And where their hearts used to be tender, they've lost sensitivity. Life is banging away at them and they don't even feel it anymore. And we ache for them. Father, we'd be foolish if we didn't think that that reality also could play out in our midst here. Lord, deep within each of our hearts, there are times when we question and we wonder if, if there's been aspects of our lives that have been futile. Lord, today the answer of the ages remains as consistent and as strong as it's ever been. And the need is just as great as it ever has been. The rock that is Christ is the higher ground that we need to move to. Lord, the floods are coming and we see them. Lord, help us to move ever closer to that higher ground to stand and take our stand on the rock that doesn't shift, that is what we need. And Jesus, I pray that by the Holy Spirit right now, you would just move upon each one of us. Show us the areas of futility that, that we don't even realize are that. Show us the things that we've been wrestling with maybe for decades. And it's time to set them aside. And Lord Jesus, 
remind us again, in a darkened time, in a trying time, you are the one that we need to embrace. Oh, Jesus, burn this into our hearts, I pray, by your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. to you. You are a rock, the only rock, the only higher ground that we can run to and, and see that difference made. So Jesus, we, we look to you and we turn to you. Father, on behalf of others that, that we may see wrestling with futility in life, Lord, we look to you to guide us as to how to minister far off. Father, in all of us, we trust and we sing in the goodness of our God. Thank you. Amen. 